Hello, hello. My name is Ajuns, and uh, today we are looking at uh, community psychiatry, and this is part two of our lesson. In part two, we are going to explain uh, the concept of community mental health services in Zambia. Okay, so this was our second objective within a community psychiatry lesson. We have uh, looked at part one, and uh, before you can uh, listen or you can follow part two, I urge you to uh, listen fully to our presentation in part one of uh, these uh, studies of community psychiatry. Okay, that is uh, the only way you are going to follow and understand some terminologies that we are going to use in uh, part two. Okay, so in part two, we are going to explain the concept of community mental health services in Zambia. In order for us uh, to understand where we are now as a country in regards to community mental health, we need uh, to go back and uh, briefly examine the historical background of community psychiatry. So let me give a bit of background of community psychiatry in Zambia. At first, mentally ill patients were cared for in large mental hospitals known as asylums. Okay, so we had asylums where we were taking care of patients with mental illness. However, this led to a large group of patients getting admitted and cared for in mental institutions for a long period of time, even years, that uh, these people could be admitted. So this situation led to institutionalism, okay, in which uh, uh, our, the clients that were admitted developed a uh, certain uh, behavior, okay, of institutionalism. Okay, so some of the signs and symptoms of institutionalism, okay, we discussed uh, the definition of institutionalism in our first part. So some of the signs of institutionalism include dependency, lack of initiative, inability to solve problems, lacking assertive skills, then not being able to make decision and also not being able to live outside the mental institution. So these are the signs uh, these are the signs of institutionalism. So institutionalism is simply the dependency behavior that is developed by patients who have been admitted for a long time and like uh, they start showing a resistance to discharge. To discharge. So uh, keeping of patients in a uh, these health uh, asylum or institutions where they are being cared for uh, for a long period of time with mental illness, it leads uh, these clients to develop signs of institutionalism. And these signs include dependency, lack of initiative, inability to solve problems, and also not being able to make decisions, and also failing to live outside the mental institution. So because of this, uh, patients were so dependent that they became helpless and as well as these patients were being mistreated and exploited by the health professionals with minimal information on their condition. So, minimal information on their condition, this uh, concerns that is the course of treatment that the patients were on, the likely prognosis, and also the care or treatment. So, there was minimal information that the clients knew about this, except knowing that they are in admission. So, to put an end to the exploitation of patients, who were institutionalized and also improved the quality of care of patients with mental illness, large hospitals were downsized or closed. This process then led to deinstitutionalization. Okay, so deinstitutionalization okay, is necessarily the discharge of patients with uh, mental illness 
and incorporating them within the community and their families. We have defined the institutionalization in our first part, but the institutionalization insisted that mental annexes were opened to general and the central hospitals so that they can take care of a patient with, the, with mental illnesses. The institutionalization also led that people with mental illness were returned within the community so that they can live there. Other reasons for deinstitutionalization included that high cost of institutional care meant that there will be poor care of those that were in the hospitals. So to reduce the cost of institutionalization, deinstitutionalization helped in the in um, uh, uniting patients with mental illnesses with the, their family. And of course, uh, deinstitutionalization also came because of a discovery of new psychotropic drugs or psychiatry drugs that can help patients necessarily improve and also be able to uh, socialize within the community or be able to live within the, the community. So, this discovery of new drugs has led to disinstitutionalization. Of course, even the issue of civil rights and activism also led to deinstitutionalization to avoid the exploitation and the maltreatment that the patient with mental illness faced in these asylums. Okay, so people of communities were... When you look at this institution, people of the community were not um, necessarily prepared for the influx of patients with mental institution. Okay, so this might have led to undesirable effects. Okay, so there was an influx of uh, patients with mental illness within the community and also that were taken to the families. So uh, most families were not led to were, were not necessarily ready for this, but otherwise, deinstitutionalization has uh, led to general hospitals and other central hospitals taking care of people with mental illnesses. Okay, and uh, some people have been included within the community or at least socialized within the community. And uh, the main reasons for deinstitutionalization, apart from exploitation that was happening in asylum, is the high cost of institutional care, uh, the discovery of uh, new drugs that can be given to the patient so that they improve, and also the pressure from civil rights activism because of the exploitation that was happening. Okay, but otherwise... Other the deinstitution had some effect also on the community that they were not ready to receive these people, okay, because of uh, the time that was needed for them to take care of these and also giving of drugs and the likes. Okay, so with that, maybe we can just look at the effect of deinstitutionalization. Okay, so. Some effects of deinstitution include barriers of social inclusion that has that led to stigma and prejudice, of which it still exists up to now. There's a lot of stigma um, against uh, patients with uh, mental illnesses. So there are a lot of prejudice, or uh, there's a lot of prejudice for patients with uh, mental illness. So the other effect of deinstitutionalization is that of poor social skills. Okay, poor social skills, the example that I can give you is inappropriate behavior in public places such as uh, shops, restaurants, or churches that we see with uh, our colleagues with the, the mental health challenge. Okay, so then um, the other effect of uh, deinstitution is um, community not uh, re being ready to receive these patients. So... Most patients, because of this, they got readmitted into state hospitals and then find that the other effect to do with deinstitutionalization is that some patients fail into criminal justice uh, system. Okay, they committed crime, they started they unknowing, but because of the mental health challenge that they were still having.
Otherwise, the other effect of deinsulinization is that some patients with mental illnesses have become homeless or they have remained vagrants. Okay, in Western countries, others were taken into nursing homes, especially or the priority was necessarily given to the elderly. Okay, then families, uh, the effect to do with effect of deinsulinization is that families since they were not prepared for the responsibility of caring for these people, they left them to just be in the street. And then um, you see that the plight of patients uh, also led to de -institutionalization. So the effort of movement by consumers, families, and mental health professionals and other NGOs uh, have come on board necessarily to take care of who patients uh, within our community with mental illnesses of which uh, the effect is that most of them they do not have a lot of funding to effectively care for the increasing number of who patients with mental illnesses that are there within the community. So these are just some of the effect of deinstitutionalization. So when I'm saying the effect of deinstitutionalization, I'm just looking at the effect of having hard discharged of a um, lot of patients from our uh, uh, institutions uh, or asylums so that they can mingle within the community. Of course, because of improved treatment that is there, but really the community uh, was not necessarily sensitized enough. So it led to different effects. Okay, so deinstitutionalization is good for community health uh, psychiatry practice because patients will not be abused in asylums or these institutions and they might find themselves being useful in one way or the other within the community. Okay, so let us now look at the introduction of community mental health services. Okay, how did the introduction of community health mental health services come about? So the pride of mental health, mental ill people in the community, that is world over, was taken into account during the Alma Ata International Conference on Primary Health Care in 1978. Okay, so since our concentration is necessarily about Zambia, is that in the following year, community psychiatry was introduced in Zambia and measures were put in place to develop community mental health services through integration into existing primary health care system as proposed within the Alma Ata International Conference. It was proposed that there should be a mental health component in which community health workers with support from neighborhood health committees and technical guidance from mental health professionals would necessarily do courses that are related to mental health. So they would be given, give, they would be given uh, mental health education so that they can help in identifying and referring patients with um, emotional problems or uh, having serious mental illnesses, okay, or having conditions that may have a mental health aspect like epilepsy and those with learning disability or behavioral problems. So this was learned through some training. Then um, there was also some encouragement of compliance to medication and keeping of review date within the courses. So this empowerment came because of the courses that they had learned because when one one is on treatment they are less likely to relapse and they are likely to show resilience okay that is the bouncing back to normalcy okay so with these people okay who are given uh, mental health education also helped in collecting and compiling simple data about uh, people with a uh, mental uh, with mental illness within the community. Okay, so uh, this came because of the Alma Ata conference. 
Hence, the shift of community health psychiatry in 1979 in Zambia started to happen. Okay, so let us now look at community mental health services that are available in Zambia as we speak now. So the mental health policy of Zambia, which guides the development of mental health services in the country, outlines the fact that disabilities and result from neurological, uh, mental and psychosocial disorders okay, should be reduced through community rehabilitation. To ensure that mental health services are delivered uh, to the community, there is uh, the strategic plan for 2007-2011, which outlines how services or service providers are to deliver services within the community. So, some of the items that are within uh, this strategic plan for 2007-2011 is that it allows for conducting of public education programs to create awareness of mental issues. It also provides for care and support skills uh, to neighborhood health com uh, communities through short courses and supervisory uh, guidance. And it also helps in networking with NGOs or gives guides or networking with NGOs with similar interests to promote mental health and prevent uh, mental health problems within the communities. So we have NGOs that necessarily exist and are making emphasis on mental health issues. <clears throat> To ensure these services are successfully provided, the strategic plan also has put in place measures to ensure that funding for community-based mental health activities is available all the time. Okay, currently the Mental Disorder Act of 1951 is, has been repealed to pave way for a new act. This new act which is uh, still in the form of uh, the Mental Health Service Bill 2006, um, sets a clear direction and focus for mental health services outside institution settings in the country. Examples of uh, community mental health services in Zambia includes the home visits that can be done okay, for families that are taking care of uh, uh, patients or clients with mental illness, the mental health uh, corners that we have in uh, primary health care uh, settings or clinics, uh, the outreach clinics that we have, okay, the outreach clinics that we have uh, within uh, some clinics, like an example I can give Matelo, Chilenje, have uh, outreach, outreach clinics for uh, people with uh, mental illness and uh, they can assist them and give them the necessary care during um, these um, outreaches. Then there's the assessment of new cases that is continuously happening at uh, UTH, you know, Chinama outpatient department. So there's uh, this assessment that happens. And also the other example of community health uh, services in Zambia is counseling for emotional substance abuse and also mental disorders that as they continue to happen as I speak now. Okay, so... <clears throat> Today we have been uh, looking at part two of community health psychiatry. Within uh, this lesson, we are trying to explain the concept of community mental health services in Zambia. So to understand this, we looked at the background regarding community health in Zambia and how we have gotten to this historic perspective of community health in Zambia up to date. So in the past there was institutionalization okay for patients who had mental illnesses they were kept in asylums but there were some things that were noted okay these things infringed on the lights of patients with mental illnesses as they became vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. So
So institutionalization or institutionalism, okay, uh, led these people with mental illnesses to think that they just belong to these asylum. And the patient exhibited signs of dependency, lack of initiative, inability to solve problems, not being able to make decisions, or showed signs of not being able to survive or live outside the institution. So with uh, the rising costs of taking care of these uh, patients within institutions, there was a direct measure by the government to bring about deinstitutionalization. This is uh, to avoid the negativities that was associated with uh, admission of patients with mental illnesses for many years within an institution. Okay, then uh, deinstitutionalization came in and deinstitutionalization had also its own effects. Okay, had its own effects to do with uh, the community and also the individuals when it came into place as the community was not necessarily ready to receive these people with mental illnesses. Others ended up being homeless. Others found themselves in criminal justice system. But um, as it stands, a lot of strategic plans have been put in place to help and normalize the situation where we have People with mental illnesses who go for review in different uh, specialty hospitals where mental illnesses are treated and we have improved uh, drugs that are used to help patients with mental illnesses so that they can be treated and be able to be socialized within the community. There is also increased awareness to do with the education about mental illnesses and vices that predispose to mental illnesses. Okay, so when uh, looking necessarily at um, the background of uh, community health uh, uh, services in Zambia, uh, what is cardinal is talk about institutionalization, uh, the negative factors that it brought about, and then look at institutionalization and also its effect and also the positive factors that it the institutionalization brought about. So when you have talked about that, then uh, you can uh, necessarily give examples within the community of how community mental health services in Zambia are being conducted in order to normalize the situation. Of course, we also have some laws, okay? The Mental uh, Disorders Act of 1951 which is uh, being repealed to pave way for the Mental Health Service Bill of 2006. So if uh, there's adequate improvement in this, then uh, we are going to have who? Um, we're going to have a good welfare, uh, social welfare for patients with the mental illnesses. Okay, and act as a model and providing the best mental health services in the world. So from me, I'm saying thank you and keep studying.